Okay. <clears throat> Life has been extremely tough over the past two years. I have wept, I have cried, and I have tried. Yet, thy bones shall not be broken. I am sincerely grateful that I was given this unique opportunity to learn by being humbled. Rembrandt's ultimate graphic masterpiece remains a work in progress, and if you ask me right now, I say, it defeats modern technology. Perhaps on another occasion there will be new opportunities for me to explain why that is so. But briefly, Rembrandt's dry points are the ultimate Turing test for computer vision. Concluding my research fellowship at the Rex Museum, instead I want to ask a rather philosophical question about the nature of visual images and that of prints in particular. What is truth? In art it is honesty, as much as it is skill and beauty. Idolaters may indulge in the forgery of beauty and the temptation of the fake. Woe upon them, for there is no reality. But what is real, and is what is real also truthful? I ask these questions because they have practical relevance. Are these two pictures of the same image? Are they both authentic prints? A decisive answer would make a considerable difference. As I got stuck on the three crosses, I began procrastinating, peeking into online auctions way over my budget. Until I stumbled upon this luring find. I know, too good to be true. And yet it might, precisely because the description is meager. The online seller says that the print is a 19th century restrike, which it might. But such later editions should have the telltale mark that here is lacking. What if this were in fact an early impression? Wow. Whatever, it's cheap anyway. And it's a nice portrait. It may be Rembrandt's father. Others have recognized Father Tikatz. In the literature it goes by the rather dull title First Oriental Head. Indeed, he might just as well be that Palestine governor who on once asked what is truth. To find truth in beauty sometimes you have to look in reverse. Rembrandt did two smaller exercises five years earlier, properly signed with the artist's monogram. Now he signs with Gerritu Keert. So he explicitly says he didn't make but only retouched it? Does that mean he doesn't claim authorship? In fact, our print is known as the first oriental head because it belongs to a set of four copies after Jan Levens. Unscrupulous copies indeed. All geretukeerd. But as Levens' name isn't mentioned as the original inventor on the plate by today's standards, that makes Rembrandt a plagiarist. Surely Rembrandt wasn't counterfeiting. And yet, somewhere I read the suggestion that he might have even traced Levin's example using the equivalent of our translucent graph paper. It seems a probable proposition indeed. <laughs> as long as you don't care for absolute size and forget to scale the images of these objects to their physical dimensions. You see, accurate measurement do does matter. No, Rembrandt was not a forger and neither was Levin's. In the old days, copying was just natural. Indeed, prints were the reproductive medium par excellence. In recent times, mechanical reproductions are more easily made, still through the medium of print, and now online as well, which allows for spectacular close-ups. The invention of photography was a true game-changer. It still is the ground truth for all printed reproductions. Current printing technology nearly reaches the level of detail offered by digital pixels. Just one generation ago, scholars had to go by horrible reproductions that completely destroyed the beautiful details that make up all the quality of original prints. In the 1950s, things were still different. Those intaglio reproductions are stunning, even by today's standards. Back then, commercial printing was still a craft, using the same printing techniques which it was replicating. If done well, heliographies from the 1880s are almost indistinguishable from the original. But on close-up, and especially compared to a collection of photos, the fraud of heliography is exposed to. Undoubtedly, digital high-resolution photography is the best we have to reproduce physical objects. But do they capture the true image of a print? No, because they remain mere snapshots of objects which are themselves snapshots of yet some other object's life cycle. No matter the quality of the photo, no matter how well the printing had been, a single digitization does never capture a print's true image. I can say that with confidence, that there is such a thing as a true image, because I found a way to go beyond the pixels and come to a true structure-aware understanding of the very stroke build-up of Rembrandt's actual drawing. 
Of course, I was eager to put my fancy techniques to the test as a forensic tool to prove whether my online purchase was real or fake. Because if the seller doesn't tell you and the print ships without credentials, without pedigree of ownership or watermarks proving its age, then what do you do? Actually look at it, of course, really close up and so digitize. The Rex Museum's photographers comply with the latest standards. But if you are going to study the images in their own right, then I have some additional recommendations. When I am doing the digitization myself, then I do not one, but multiple scans at different angles. Because a printed sheet of paper never lies completely flat, you'll get inaccurate geometry and fuzzy colors if you would do a single scan only. By blending multiple scans of the same object and analyzing frequencies and saturation values, the fused end result is a high fidelity representation of the actual picture, stripped of all the noise that originates from the material substrate only. So far, so good. But how to judge the truth of a digitized picture? Surely not all by itself, but only through comparison with some, some measure of truth, an infallible authority, something robust and immutable, the very copper plate, of course, from which all true prints originate. If we are lucky, then we can grab the ultimate gold standard of truth from the web even, or not, because the copper plate has worn out and its image is barely visible. Let's see if we can use it as a measuring stick nevertheless. In the downloaded image file, first we detect the edges of the plate, so we can crop it. Next we look in multiple channels and various dimensions to project an essentially three-dimensional object to a flat ray of bits. Et voilà! A visible drawing resurrected from scattered light. At least we have a solid geometry to take as a measuring stick. The extracted image itself is still quite useless for visual comparison. We need something better which are, of course, the images of the impressions, like those we keep in Amsterdam. Musea all over the world keep Rembrandt prints, and our very own Erik Interding has done all the hard labor of tracking them down. By searching on the web we can harvest pretty much all the images. Thanks to efforts of various institutions and standards like IIIF, the tedious googling could be automated. It's a massive amount of image and metadata to juggle around. So, I implemented a state-of-the-art data management system of my own, specifically designed for sprint scholarship. Once images and metadata are all in, they must be rescaled so as to match and fit the exact same size. But that's only one small part of the job. We must get rid of all the clutter, so we can align not the pixel sizes, but the actual pictures, if you understand what I mean. Yes, pixel-precise image alignment requires an entire semester to talk about. Prints are particularly difficult because computers can get easily confused by dense and smudgy layers of finely hatched crossing lines. And yet, for human eyes the image extracted from the copper plate was useless. Computer vision instead can be satisfied with just a few hints already. Suffice it to say that I cracked some of the critical difficulties involving perfect alignment of prints. The key thing to remember is that we are always looking for a truth not yet revealed hidden in the real world, using every bit of revelation we can lay our hands on, until we, almost, <coughs> and only roughly, arrive gradually finer and finer at the nearest approximation of truth as it shimmers through in reality. A common ground truth, fused by computing the average values for each pixel in the entire stack of images. Each single impression has now been perfectly aligned. Like in up to microns of perfection, even in densely hatched areas where due to patches of moist in the paper, ink could be poor at times. On other impressions Rembrandt had wiped away too much of the ink. In yet others, the precise topology of the cross-hatching has become ambiguous. In such cases, pixel-perfect alignment is theoretically impossible, likely because these are images of two different images. I mean, this copy, which is in New York, is an impression of the fourth state. But what does that mean? Interdings catalog lists but two extant copies of third and fourth state, featuring an additional landscape, not by Rembrandt. Indeed, if it would have been strongly printed, you would expect it to shine through on the better radiography. Hinterdink observed that most of the sketching was drawn in pen and ink on top of a real print, retouching something hardly visible on the impression itself. If we inspect up close, then indeed we see that the lines have doubled. Silver strokes of the pen on paper, while the faintest ones must have been the copper plate. Maybe the sketch was Rembrandt's after all, perhaps an épreuve d'artiste in dry point with a needle, as Rembrandt did so often. In any case, it was decided 
to be done away with. In virtual reality we can play around with hypotheses because they are always non-intrusive. Unlike burnishing a copper surface, if the landscape had ever been etched into the copper plate, there should be traces left, but none are to be found there today. I know, because I virtually restorated the copper plate. I mean, I re-inked it, dirty as it is. But by aligning all the impressions by now, I have a much cleaner picture. To virtually varnish the plate as it would have looked like when Remnant himself had it on his desk. Without all the dirt, scratches, corrosion and oxidation of later times. Wash it off in a bed of digital aquaforte to end up with a nicely polished, shiny piece of art. Finally, the true image reconstructed from the aligned impressions is now used to do a much cleaner inking job. That's the beauty of working with a virtual stack of images of the same thing. They are all cross-linked, pieces of evidence of a common truth. Ok, I admit that I cheated. I had to slightly tweak the geometry of the plate. Let's do that again. A little white light for the sake of truth, is it? Mm, not exactly, you see. During alignment I computed the deformation fields for all images in the stack. This is the average distortion of all the impressions relative to the geometry of the plate. Either all sheets of printed paper got stretched while they were rolled through the printing press, or the copper plate in getting was not entirely level when photographed. I guess it is both. But there's no way to tell the respective portion apart. In any case, there is a bend in the plate and perhaps traces of the hammering of the copper can be observed as well. Anyways, the copper plate measures about 15 by 13 centimeters, but that is today. Naturally, it eroded over time. Based on the plate marks visible on the impressions, I can rewind the shrinking and tell you what the plate's original di dimensions were exactly. Those measurements are weird though, at least in a decimal system. A genius like Rembrandt wouldn't choose arbitrary proportions, would he? Of course he didn't. Measuring in Amsterdam inches. He cut his plate roughly, but precise to the millimeter, as a harmonic rectangle of rational proportion from a larger sheet of copper. I think that's a nice discovery, which catalographers may be reminded when measuring things henceforth. Without further ado and a brand new freshly inked copper plate, let's roll the press. The digital paper is still wet, but I hope you will agree that, once dry, the fruits of my labors is worth the effort. I find it stunning, especially zoomed in at maximum resolution where all the little details start to pop. The sum has become much more than its parts, as by magic we went from low resolution input to near super resolution output. The five copies in the Rex Museum are exquisite impressions, and they have been digitized very well. But even our finest copy isn't nearly as clear as the brand new virtual composite, because it remains just a material snapshot of how the copper plate was once inked and pressed into a sheet of paper, which on its turn aged over the centuries. Superfluous ink can now be detected while missing parts can be filled in using the new virtual composite. More than any single impression on paper, my high precision reconstruction is a much more complete and accurate representation of Rembrandt's original drawing, as he intended it and scratched it laboriously into a plate of copper. Indeed, it truly is the ultimate gold standard for comparison. And thus, last but not least, we can finally use it to verify or falsify my online find. At first sight it seems pretty much an exact match, be it rather darkly inked. First thing to note is that the sheet was trimmed. Cropping is nothing unusual for all master prints, but here it has been rather carelessly done. Through diffing, tiny flecks and spots of dirt are highlighted. Also there is a faint scratch below the signature. What most stands out is the richly applied ink in the dark areas again. With a pseudo X-ray comparison the generous inking is much even more visible. Still nothing to worry about, except that the ink distribution is a bit all too harsh. Not a normal Gaussian distribution. Other features deserve more suspicion. These deviations look too clear cut to be a random ink squash. Hmm, more like intentional strokes of the graver. With simple arithmetics on pixel intensity values you can do only so much. Usually image diffs only consider brightness. Consequently, significant visual differences escape our attention precisely in the darker areas where the perceptual difference is most notable. There is no distinction, it all becomes incoherent grayish noise. So let's try something else and amplify the local contrast based on structural coherence. 
Whoa, the verdict is undeniable. It's a fake. But it's an extremely well-made forgery. The counterfeiter was very well knowing what he was doing and where to do it. I'll show you a sneak peek into my wizardry. This is a directional analysis of the canonical image. It segments all the strokes based on their orientation. The final derivative beautifully shows that the stroke built up of Rembrandt's dense cross-hatching. This is the same analysis for the forgery. And this is the difference between the two. What it reveals is that which is present in the forgery only. And there we are. The forger was smart. He took an authentic impression and photographed it meticulously. From that photo he made an outstanding heliographic etching. But no matter how well they are done, heliographies always turn out dull, especially in the dark areas, where they fail to capture the texture of the original print. All the lines and strokes dissolve into the grain of the aqua tint. To turn the reproduction into a convincing facsimile, the counterfeiter then took his burin and by hand he engraved over the greyish areas, but his retouching remained guesswork. While he looked at a single impression only, he could not unravel the precise direction of Rembrandt's original lines. I instead do not guess, but by digital analysis of the dense cross-hatching, I can find and trace back Rembrandt's original hand because I looked not at one impression only, but at pretty much all authentic copies kept in the world's museum, from which I reconstructed their common and true image. Now, who was this extremely talented con artist who did his beautiful and highly convincing forgery? Charles Amand Durand. If you're in print acquisitions, then you know the mark. And you fear it when Durand forgot, so to speak, to stamp a copy. Indeed, a proper signature is all that stands between replica and forgery, true and false. I could go on and tell you all about it, but that's for another talk. Given the evidence of copper and dozens of authentic impressions, rather than calling the Pierpont's copy real and the heliography fake, we should really say both share Rembrandt's underdrawing. But while the first is contemporary with Rembrandt, it has stuff drawn over overtly that doesn't belong to the print proper. The latter too adds a lot, a lot of scribbling, but does it cunningly precisely to be a more convincing representation of Rembrandt's original invention. Or perhaps the invention was not Rembrandt's after all. Maybe it was Rembrandt who did the copying in the first place. No different than Amand Durand did, although the latter used 19th century technology, while I make use of the digital tech of our age. Truly, truth can be amazing. May we ponder. If the replica is sincerely made, can it then still be called a fake? For if it is really well done, then perhaps it might even be a better icon of truth. Now, truth only reveals itself as truth when it returns into the world and becomes real. That is, printed on tangible paper, but then as it should. As a 21st century exact replica, better than any reproduction or forgery, better because it cannot be anything else than being honest in order to be believed. Finally, you can study a remnant as he truly is, while the real things remain safely stored in the sacred tabernacle of the museum. P286 is just one of Rembrandt's prints. I worked on many, many more, and have everything staged to build a visual online database of Rembrandt's entire graphic oeuvre. But for that to be realized in all its potential, I'll need a sponsor or another scholarship. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, everybody.